Thank you everyone for attending today's session, Estate Litigation Fundamentals, What Every Practitioner Needs to Know. Today's session will run about 50 minutes with time at the end to answer questions. Please post any questions in the chat box. Any unanswered questions will be answered offline today after the session. We have received a tremendous response to this webinar and we are hosting a large audience. If you experience technical difficulties, we suggest you exit the meeting and re-enter it using the link provided in the email. Rest assured that LexisNexis will distribute a recording of today's session in a follow-up email. Now we will meet today's presenters. I am your moderator for today, Monica Sorensen. I am the print marketing manager here at LexisNexis Canada. Amy Mortimer is a partner at Clark Wilson LLP and co-chair of the firm's estate and trust litigation practice group. She practices exclusively in the area of estate and trust litigation, including elder law. Ms. Mortimer has appeared at all levels of the court in British Columbia and at the Supreme Court of Canada. Mark Weintraub is a partner at Clark Wilson LLP and is the firm's senior estate and trust litigator. He has acted as counsel in a broad range of litigation matters, including Wills Variation Act claims, negligent or fraudulent estate administration, wills and trusts interpretation, as well as committee ships, power of attorney disputes, and claims involving elder abuse. I would now like to turn it over to Amy and Mark. Thank you, Monica. And thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, as Monica mentioned, there is a large attendance and it's uh, from all across Canada. We have people from every province except for PEI. And I would like to welcome you and thank you for spending time with us today. Um, I will note that uh, this presentation arose out of a textbook that Mark and I and our team at Clark Wilson uh, worked together with um, LexisNexis to publish last year. And that book is called British Columbia Estate Litigation. And this is a seminar that arises out of it. But what we've done, because we know we have so many people from other provinces, is when we were working on the materials that we put together for you today, we chose items that we think will be applicable all across Canada um, and that can work with you in your practice. In addition to some concepts that we'll be discussing, we'll also have some comments about practice management that we think is likely to be applicable all across the, uh, the country. What we're going to talk about today is really uh, starting with an overview. I want to talk a little bit about the context of estate litigation in British Columbia so that you get a background and, and a, an idea of the context within which our comments are being made. Hopefully the uh, things that we're seeing out here are similar to the, the uh, trends that you're seeing where you're practicing. And so you'll be able to gauge that once we go through a little bit of the overview. We're going to talk about wills variation, but we recognize that that's um, something that is distinct to British Columbia in the way in which we uh, work with uh, wills variation. And so we've chosen a topic there on spouses, which we think is broader application. We're gonna speak on a couple of topics on incapacity and undue influence. And we're going to spend a little bit of time about the good conscience constructive trust. And Mark's going to talk about it again in a wills variation context, but really this is a type of claim that can be applied um, uh, more broadly. And we're using this as an example of how you might think about applying this in your practice. I'm gonna to touch briefly on passing accounts and executor remuneration. And then as Monica mentioned, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and further discussion. So, Without further ado, let's give you a little bit of a background of how we practice here in British Columbia and what we're seeing in the estate and trust litigation field. In particular, over the last many years, we've been seeing an increase in the number of files that are coming in, the number of claims that are being made in an estate context. And we're attributing that to three trends in particular. The first is simply the demographics. It's the baby boomers that are aging through the system. And baby boomers, as you know, have a significant amount of wealth, and that's going to be transitioning from that generation to the next generation in the years and decades perhaps to come. So we're seeing that put more um, cases into the estate litigation context. 
Similarly, in British Columbia, we have a number of cases where there are second or later marriages or relationships where couples are getting together later in life and they already have amassed their fortune and they already have their children. And then when one of them passes, litigation ensues because we are seeing a lot of uh, these cases driven by the family dynamics between a relationship, a newer relationship and children's from the first relationship. So we're seeing more of those pushing cases into the estate litigation world. Finally, we're seeing in terms of the size of the estates that are coming through in British Columbia and in particular in the lower mainland here around Vancouver, we're seeing significant increases in value of real property. And so somebody who bought their home 30 years ago for $100,000 on the west side of Vancouver now has a house worth $3 million. And so when you have these properties that are worth a significant uh, amount of money, the estates become larger and that's driving, it seems, uh, more estate litigation through. So those are trends that we're seeing and ones that I anticipate that we'll continue to see in the foreseeable future that are going to continue to drive estate litigation to the courts or alternative uh, dispute resolution systems. In British Columbia, we we say recently, but I guess it's not recently anymore. Seven years ago, we had a very significant change in the legislation in that uh, WESA, the Wills, Estate and Succession Act, was brought into force. That act um, brought together a number of older statutes, updated them, and it was an attempt to modernize uh, and, and, and create a cohesive scheme for estate and um, trust. Um, not just litigation, but also administration and planning. And so when WESA came in, uh, we saw um, a move towards allowing the courts more discretion to take steps to allow the will makers intentions to be uh, given effect to, even if we, for example, don't have form, um, formal compliance with the execution requirements of a will. So we're seeing that kind of underlying drive in the new legislation, which is part of its modernization. So we have those, and I think that ties into what we're seeing here in British Columbia, which is what seems to be an openness on the part of our courts to um, entertain equitable claims and to allow uh, claims that maybe were a little bit um, less common in earlier times to be given effect to, to again, do what the will maker wishes. Um, and so we're gonna probably use the, will, the word will maker uh, interchangeably with testator because um, the new legislation WESA uses will maker as the, um, as, the, as the term. Now, also as part of the overview, we wanna talk a little bit about launching a claim and a little bit of practice management and the things that we do here at Clark Wilson. So Mark, um, if you could, uh, talk to us about that. Thank you, Amy. Well, as you can see, uh, most of these issues relate to any piece of litigation. There's some that are unique to estate litigation or have some slight nuances. I think it bears <coughs> reviewing, the, reviewing them uh, in, in the context of bringing in a new client that has an estate file. So what's really critical in a state litigation is to identify the goals in the larger context of what's achievable. So you're, you're, you're bringing in a client who likely is suffering from some emotional element. There has been likely loss in many of these cases uh, and they have to deal with the legal situation, sometimes a very critical situation that involves family members. Sometimes it involves betrayal, uh, often a feeling that something has been taken or stolen. It dredges up feelings from childhood. So it's really important to recognize that the client that comes in is in a <clears throat> disabled state to some extent. It's important to validate those feelings but it's also important to guide them to a more objective place and to really communicate that as much as we can be empathetic, our job is as lawyers and there is a limited landscape in which we operate. 
So sometimes, in fact, we have to identify what the goals of the client can be. Sometimes they come in with unrealistic goals. Sometimes we can provide them with options that they did not think were even possible. And of course, client goals shift as the litigation itself unfolds in terms of what they experience, in terms of the cost. And so it's important as well to check in periodically with those objectives. Now, sometimes I think that we discuss client objectives um, perhaps in a, a sort of light and breezy way as keeping client expectations low that permits the lawyer at the end of the day sometimes to seem heroic. But I, I don't really think that, that any of us are of the view that that's the, the, the most ethical way to practice. I think a better way of describing it is to not create unrealistic expectations for the client. Now, when we, when we do the, the intake, often we find that there is an initial telephone call. Sometimes it's just out of the blue and we get a little bit caught unawares. It is important to remember that in, in a firm, we may be acting for a party in which uh, the person is uh, uh, in a file that the person is talking about. So the best practice really is when you get a new call is really to uh, be polite, but interrupt and say there's really nothing that can be discuss about the file until the basics of the names, the parties are provided uh, ideally through email. That way you avoid any potential conflicts. You also make certain that the person is actually serious about uh, the litigation by putting them off a little bit and not getting into the discussion. I know it's tempting sometimes uh, because we want to bring in clients to engage a little bit in discussion and talk in a theoretical way, but we have determined that the best practice is really to shut that, that call down and ask the person to communicate by email. So, I mean, that's, that's the initial uh, telephone contact. And of course, a good note taking has to happen no matter how brief that call is. When you get to the first meeting, uh, the best practice is to really have excellent note taking. That first meeting will be imprinted on the mind of the client and you will find, you know, years down the road, the client saying, well, you said this at the meeting. Uh, my note taking is not great and I find it difficult to type on a, when, when I say note taking, I mean my writing is not great. And I find uh, it's difficult to be typing on a computer while I'm focused on the client. So I have the luxury of bringing in a student or an associate invariably to every client meeting. And um, I ask the student to take very careful notes and have to remind the student sometimes not to get too carried away with hearing the narrative and that their job is the most careful note taking. All right, that takes us to the third point, which is the identification of potential causes of action. And here there, I think, needs to be what I might refer to as both a conservative but creative approach. Many causes of action that we use in the state litigation, such as just enrichment, the doctrine of righteousness, knowledge and approval, proprietary estoppel, those have evolved as new causes of action. And lawyers like us have, have developed those when confronted with situations where there's, there were seemingly no, no remedies. Certainly those have been developed significantly and in the estate litigation context, there are leading Supreme Court of Canada decisions on all of our leading areas, all of our important areas, such as undue influence and wills variation, unjust enrichment and constructive trust. And they really map out the fundamentals uh, and will map out those fundamentals for the next several decades. So it's critical to be aware of those foundational causes of action, but at the same time to consider the possibilities of application of new or modified causes of action arising out of those foundational cases. Now we'll be talking about one of those uh, uh, newly evolving causes of action, the good conscience of Santa Trust later on in the presentation. 
All right, so that takes us to um, the listing of witnesses and identification of categories of documents. Well, here I think it, it's not any different than taking any other taking in any other piece of litigation. Uh, as part of the intake, it's important to find out who the material witnesses are and to identify all the categories of documents. Uh, some counsel make it a practice of reaching out to witnesses early on, and that probably is a good practice, although of course there's exceptions to every rule. I don't have to talk too much about documents in every, every piece of litigation. Documents are, at, are absolutely critical, and it's just a reminder to ensure that this part of the piece is really paid attention to, and we'll focus a little bit more on, on medical records, which, which can be unique to the state litigation. Again, in the intake, give, give consideration to the retaining of an expert or other consultant early on, uh, and discuss that with the client as well, because that can be, that can be a cost. With respect to the opinion letter, I appreciate that, that uh, the approach to opinion letter may vary uh, depending upon the culture of, of the firm. Our practice in our firm is to encourage all of us to provide some form of opinion letter after that initial intake. The opinion letter doesn't have to be 12 or 15 pages, and we all know the dangers of going down the road of a, a fully researched opinion, and you end up with a very significant bill before the client is even, before the case is even out the door. But it is important to at least have some type of roadmap for yourself and for the client, which deals with the, the essential elements of the facts as they're known, the causes of action, some uh, discussion about potential procedures, timelines, and budgeting considerations. I don't think I have to emphasize the importance of qualifying an opinion, but simply because you're at an early stage case doesn't exclude the necessity for an opinion. I can't really emphasize how, how important that can be to really set the tone of the file. And it gives comfort to the client that there's something in writing that really lays the, the table, so to speak, from, from beginning to end. One of, the, one of the great challenges uh, for clients is this feeling that they're in a quagmire, they're in a swamp, and you have to give them hope. You have to give them light at the end of the title, uh, in, in, end of the line, so that they know they're, they're going from A to Z, and there is some closure with benchmarks along the way. So, I mean, I think that's all I'll say on on uh, on the initial steps to launching the launching claim. And back to you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, let's move into uh, our topics, and uh, we're going to need to push through them. Um, I know that if you do have questions as we go, if you're putting them into the chat, there should be time at the end, as long as we push through uh, to uh, get to those, and we can always answer further questions by email following the event. Now, with wills variation, keeping in mind that our legislation uh, may be different and is different from other provinces, uh, the one battle that we often see in wills variation is whether or not the spouse even has standing to bring the claim. And that's because in British Columbia, uh, WESA, our legislation says a spouse is either somebody who is legally married to the deceased or who had lived with him or her in a marriage-like relationship for at least two years. And so this phrase marriage-like relationship or more specifically lived with each other in a marriage-like relationship becomes a battleground that we see played out in wills variation claims, but we also see them in intestacy claims and other claims where uh, standing as a spouse has some significance in the estate world. And so, what we're doing here is not talking so much about um, what does it mean to be a spouse because that's not an easy answer. What we've done is we've included here some of the cases that um, are really trying to grapple with this because we are seeing now in society generally 
a, a shift in what does it mean to be in a spousal like relationship? How many people are in the spousal like relationship? We're seeing polyamory coming around uh, more frequently than we have in the past. And are we going to see the courts accepting it? And, and to a certain extent, we're starting to see it come through mostly in a family context right now um, in our courts in British Columbia. Um, but we're seeing it in estate planning and family planning um, documents. So we know that uh, these are just a matter of time before it comes to the courts. And the courts are going to need to decide, is this a marriage-like relationship? It's obviously a very context-specific inquiry by the court. And uh, frankly, as, as counsel, it's our job to gather the relevant factors. And that's why, as Mark mentioned, checking with those witnesses, making the list of witnesses from the early stage so that you can inform your case going forward so you know what evidence you have to bring is very important. Some of these cases here that we've put in, the Mother One and the Connor Estate cases are getting a little bit older, but they are important in the grappling uh, with what does it mean to be a spouse. And in the Mother One and Solace Trust case, that was a, a case where the deceased um, had a number of children with a number of different women, and some of those women had made allegations that they were the spouse. And so this was our court trying to grapple with it and, and trying to say, what, is, what does it mean to be in a marriage-like relationship? And our judge there, Justice Myers, said, um, this is a really an elastic concept, and we really need to look at all of the facts. One of the pieces that we see here is, it, is it's living together with each other in a marriage-like relationship. And that was something that in 2017, our courts grappled with in the Connor estate. In Connor, the deceased um, had a hoarding illness. And so she, her home was very, very uh, packed with clothes and, and other items. And, um, and so, so the, the, um, the person who was claiming to be the spouse never lived with them, with the woman. Um, and also that same person who was claiming to be the spouse of the deceased had been in a legal uh, marriage with another person for uh, the bulk of their relationship. But what the court really uh, grappled with there in finding that this person was indeed the spouse of the deceased was he found, Justice Kent found, that living together is not the same as cohabiting. You don't need to be in the same house in order to be living together in a marriage-like relationship. And I think that's important, particularly for lats, living apart together. We're seeing that a lot more frequently um, in British Columbia and perhaps uh, elsewhere in the country. And this is something that a trend that we're going to continue to see and we're going to continue to grapple with. So we've put this case in here to perhaps help you if that's one of your cases that you're dealing with. The other case I want to talk about briefly is this Han and Dorje case, which came out fairly recently here. It's actually a family case in British Columbia. And it's an amendment of pleadings. There, uh, the woman is amending her pleadings or applying to ask permission to amend her, her pleadings in order to play, uh, claim a spousal relationship and so that she could have spousal support. And what's very interesting on these facts is that their relationship began, uh, he was a, um, a Buddhist monk. She was a, a person who wanted to become a Buddhist nun. Uh, they saw each other four times in total. The first two were in public settings. The third was in her room at the, at the facility and um, where she alleged that there was an unwanted sexual encounter. And, um, and then the fourth time in the presence of his bodyguards where she uh, says that uh, she told him uh, that she had become pregnant as a result of their third meeting. Now, the spousal relationship that she alleged did not begin until after they um, stop seeing one another because he uh, traveled the world and I think was in India at the time, but she settled here in the lower mainland in British Columbia. And, um, and they had a text, primarily text relationship. They had a, an app, but they would send texts to one another with emojis and whatnot. Um, they had some email communications. They had no video communications. They had a few uh, telephone communications. And she was alleging that during those remote or virtual communications, she became a spouse. And while there was no decision on whether or not on these facts she was a spouse, our court said, this is something that needs to be determined on the 
merits. We need to have a full hearing of this. You are permitted to amend your pleading and um, the court can deal with it in due course. And I think this is very uh, important because our court here specifically recognizes that in this time of COVID, there are a number of relationships which are virtual, which have little or no in-person meeting. And then we're going to need to be grappling with probably the family lawyers first, but ultimately us too, grappling with whether a virtual relationship can amount to a spousal relationship. So these are just some cases to help you um, explore the boundaries of what does it mean to be in a marriage-like relationship. There are uh, many others, but um, if any of those circumstances seem like something that you're grappling with, I recommend you read these cases and then note them up and move forward that way. Those are the comments I wanted to make on Will's variation. And Mark, you were going to just briefly address a few comments on medical evidence, again, circling back to um, identifying the experts, as you, you noted in the opening stages of our uh, file opening procedure. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Amy. So we tend to think that medical records are important only in capacity or in the influence cases, but there may be some fact patterns in other types of cases where the deceased's cognitive functioning or medical condition otherwise might be relevant. And therefore, consideration should really be given in every case as to whether records should be obtained. Now, with respect to medical records, uh, give thought not only to doctors and hospitals, those are the obvious ones, but care facilities who often have good record keeping or not so good record keeping, private nurses, uh, social workers. And this should be done early on, once you brought in the file, uh, to really get those institutions or demands because production of records can take a very long time. You want to get at those records as early as possible. Some of them are very hard to read with handwritten notes. Uh, some of them contain really little of probative value, but there are times when real nuggets are located. So uh, that's really a critical part of the process. With respect to the choice of a geriatric psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a general practitioner, uh, as, as we've noted, do give thought early on as to retaining your expert that should be done as early as possible and really get the letter out the door as soon as you have identified what, uh, what is needed. So you have that expert lined up. There may be cases where a psychiatrist is preferred if there are more drug interactions, but generally we have found that either a geriatric psychiatrist or a geriatric psychologist is equally competent and uh, viewed, uh, viewed well by the courts. Uh, you need to look at the ability of your expert to be responsive. They're very busy. Some are more responsive than others, and you want to keep the file moving along. You don't want it to be bogged down with your expert. You'll also want to take a look at the track record. How successful are they in court? Uh, that obviously is critical. There are some general practitioners that have specialties in geriatrics. Uh, they are sometimes more accessible for certain situations like comiteeships, but generally speaking, we think it's better to proceed with the highest level of qualification. Amy, back to you. Thanks, Mark. The other piece we wanted to mention on incapacity and undue influence is the doctrine of righteousness. Now, Mark mentioned it earlier today, and it is something that was more common um, at the first half of the 20th century, although it did originate in England in the um, 1830s. And really, we think this is a trend that's going to become more um, um, or, or a tool that we can use more as we see um, elderly people who may be subject to predatory behavior. And that's really why we want to bring it to light because it has been pleaded and brought to the Supreme Court of Canada a number of times through to I think about 1965 or, or so. Um, but then it shows up not that often since then. We've seen it in 97 out here in BC and then more recently a couple of years ago um, in a case actually brought by one of Mark and my partners. Um, and so um, really what we wanna talk about is 
is this a tool that you can put into your toolbox to assist you for your clients? And when would you consider bringing it into your file? It's when you have a person who takes an active role in getting the will made or drafting the will itself. And that person, lo and behold, is a beneficiary under that suspicious will. And so what might happen if you're pleading the doctrine of righteousness and the court looks at it is that they will then require significant evidence that's going to satisfy them that these are truly the will maker's wishes. Now, the doctrine of righteousness, which I think is the better way of phrasing it because it sounds cool, um, is sometimes known as the rule from Barry and Butlin or the requirement for true and informed approval. So really what we need to see are the two pieces. The person is instrumental in the generation of the will or the circumstances are otherwise of a character that causes the court to be concerned whether the will maker truly understood the will and its effects. And so I know that you've got cases in your files that um, you think would fit in this. So I encourage you to have a, a look at the doctrine of righteousness. It starts from this case, the Barry and Butlin case back in 1838 out of England, as I mentioned. Now in that case, the deceased had only one son, but um, shortly before his death, the solicitor attended, created the will for the deceased, and, um, and in that new will, the son gets nothing, but the drafting solicitor gets a gift, as does the butler and two other people. And you'll see in the decision itself out of the Privy Council that there is some very um, strong language used about the importance of making sure that um, these truly are the wishes of the deceased and it's not um, a result of undue influence or a lack of understanding or a lack of capacity. And so the court says, well, the onus of proof is going to lie upon the party propounding the will. And when this doctrine is invoked, um, where the party has procured it, the court must be vigilant and jealous in examining the evidence in support of the instrument to ensure that that will actually does express the true wishes of the deceased. Now, ironically, in this case, the court upheld the will and said, yes, oh yes, I've looked at all of this, listened to the solicitor, and I'm satisfied that, um, that he's met the burden and the will is valid. So um, while uh, it, the, um, the rule originates here, um, you know, the, the level of evidence that was uh, before the courts was enough to satisfy this concern. So um, we, have, we, we have addressed it further in the book, but I just wanted to alert you to this concept because I think that there's going to be cases that you can use it in today. Mark, we're going to move to the, uh, the bigger portion. It's 1234, so we've got a little bit of time on this and just a little bit of time at the end for passing accounts. But this is a really important uh, subject. Mark, you've got a lot to say about the good conscience constructive trust. Thanks, Amy. Um, well, I think we, we could all have a lot to say about it once, once one really immerses one's, oneself into it because it's quite a, a fascinating concept. But we're going to limit ourselves to about 10 minutes. The, the issue here really that we're focused on is the use of a constructive trust referred to historically as a good conscience constructive trust in dealing with a, a, a situation in wills variation claims in British Columbia that really are a conundrum for practitioners. And that is because unlike other jurisdictions, we do not have anti-avoidance provisions in our legislation. So let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, we have seemingly liberal enabling legislation affording spouses and children the right to bury a will. However, if all of the deceased assets before death have been planned to fall outside of the estate through jointure, deeds of gift or trusts, there is an empty estate and therefore no effective successful variation. Put another way, there is no point burying a will which has nothing in the underlying estate. 
So the point of this brief presentation is to sketch out some of the main points. It's somewhat of a novel cause of action in the estate context. And we will be publishing a more complete analysis in the upcoming edition of the BC Advocate. But for today's uh, purposes, we'll just sketch out uh, a few of the points. So let's get to a definition of the good conscience trust with a fulsome quote of Lord Denning in the important decision of Hussey against Palmer. Thank you, Amy. So what is the good conscience constructive trust? Uh, and we can always count on Lord Denning to give us uh, a, an extraordinary uh, explanation. Let me read it because I love reading Lord Denning's words. The trust in this case, if there was one, was more in the nature of a constructive trust. But this is more a pattern of words than anything else. The two run together. By whatever name it is described, it is a trust imposed by law whenever justice and good conscience require it. It is a liberal process founded upon large principles of equity to be applied in cases where the defendant cannot conscientiously keep the property for himself alone. It is an equitable remedy by which the court can enable an aggrieved party to obtain restitution. All right, next slide, please. So when might it be used in our context? Equitable intervention should be considered when there is an established statutory or judicially created right, but no effective legal remedy. And if we apply this to the estate context and specifically the wills variation claims, we say it may be used when the deceased has arranged their estate plan to deliberately subvert otherwise valid variation claims. And there exists conscience provoking factors such as childhood abuse perpetrated by the deceased against the claimant. Maybe next slide. So we, we, we can refer to this as, a, as the classic, a right without a remedy. And um, what we've said here is that um, we've stepped back a little bit to, to really talk about what is part of the, the offense when a testator structures their affairs to divest their estate from all assets. We note that the duty of will makers is to make adequate provision for their spouses and children. That's been codified in British Columbia since 1920. New Zealand was the first common law jurisdiction to enact legislation in British Columbia followed soon after. It has remained largely unchanged from its first introduction a century ago. So it's bedrock law in British Columbia. It's also now well settled law that the provisions are to be interpreted beyond mere needed financial support uh, as were some of the earlier interpretations because of the reference to uh, support and dependency, but it has now been embraced more generously to include legal and moral obligations to benefit spouses and children, depending upon whether the estate, the, the estate can accomplish all of, all of the obligations. And that, of course, has been enunciated by Madam Justice McLaughlin in the very significant case of Catherine. Next slide. So let me just uh, uh, make the point uh, here, here again while, while you're reading the slide. Testamentary, testamentary freedom empowers will makers to structure their estates as they wish. But we say that our legislative system has placed limits on testamentary autonomy and the dependence relief legislation, which exists in some form in, in, every, in every province, is just one of those restraints. And the Supreme Court of Canada through Tatman has also imposed this societal responsibility to include a moral obligation component to be applied fairly. So we say that testators should not be permitted to undermine both the will and the intent of the legislature having spoken for a hundred years and the highest court of the land through the Supreme Court by a relatively simple slate of hand in circumstances where manifest injustice 
would arise. Put another way, we argue that our courts are not helpless in these circumstances and that the constructive good conscience trust may be an answer to at least the most egregious of fact patterns which we as practitioners encounter. All right, so I think you've probably read that slide. Um, what is, where, where did the good conscience construction trust come from? Well, we've traced it back to the good old 17th century, uh, originally to address fraudulent conduct. But in uh, England, it actually started expanding to address conduct that may not have been fraudulent, but was perceived by the courts at the time as inequitable. Now, moving to the Canadian context, we've identified four Supreme Court of Canada, well, three Supreme Court of Canada decisions and one BC appellate decision, which uh, really identify the existence of the good conscience constructive trust. There was some argument that perhaps as the constructive trust as a remedy worked its way through the system, that what we might call the substantive good conscience trust was ousted. I think the better reading of these cases make it quite clear that the good conscience, substantive, constructive trust is still available to practitioners. Although uh, I hasten to add in the most recent decision of Moore and Sweet, which we should really all read because of uh, its important uh, decision making on just enrichment, the majority of the court did hold out the possibility uh, for equity to operate through the good conscience constructive trust concept. Justice Cote, speaking for the court's majority, noted the inquiry on the expansion of a good conscience constructive trust was best left for another day, and these remain open questions. Although I will hasten to add that going back to Sulos, Madam Justice McLaughlin really uh, went very strongly on the continued existence of the Good Conscience Trust and the importance of applying it to circumstances as they might arise. And you see that quote there. Uh, Amy, next slide. All right, so I, I think in summary, it is a fair reading of the development of the case law that the good conscience constructive trust is a fle flexible, equitable concept that courts are prepared to use in the right circumstances. And what, the, what might those circumstances be in the wills variation context? Well, we do have one case, a 2018 case, Meyer against Meyer, where in fact the good conscience trust was argued. So, uh, BC Supreme Court Justice Cro Cross in, in our uh, perspective took a narrow view of the applicability of the constructive trust concept. There wasn't really a fulsome reference to all of the authorities, the, the four decisions I referred to there. So I, I think in fairness, it wasn't argued uh, uh, expansively, but even more so the facts of that case in our view were not, in, were not sufficiently triggering to engage the conscience of the court. There was a more recent decision uh, pleaded in, in low heed, it was settled before trial, where the facts were, uh, could be characterized as egregious. The testator had over $50 million uh, of wealth that he had gifted or otherwise transferred to his surviving current wife during his lifetime. The will excluded the testator's children. The testator actually was very much aware of the Wills Variation Act and did this deliberately. He ended up leaving an estate with no assets. But here is the, 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 the important point. The adult children alleged that physical, emotional, and other childhood abuse had been perpetrated against them with terrible consequential financial and other challenges they had to endure in their adult lives. So they pleaded a trust. They pleaded that a trust should be imposed upon the transferred assets in their favor in the amount that should have been provided in accordance with a successful wills variation claim had there been any assets in the estate. So in a nutshell, that's how, that, how, that's how the good conscience constructive trust was being pleaded in that case. All right, next, uh, next uh, slide. 
So we think that ultimately this cause of action will make its way through the courts with full argument and hopefully on strong facts. Let me summarize um, the, uh, the, the test uh, to, that, that we've articulated here to ensure that third parties won't be affected. So what might the, that test look like? We have an inter vivos transfer of assets. It removes those assets from being available to satisfy a wills variation claim. There's the presence of unconscionable circumstances. And here's the, the, the last one is very important. The absence of any indication that a constructive trust would have an unfair or unjust effect on the defendant or third parties. Next slide, Amy. So let's wrap it up. To avoid good faith complaint, uh, claimants being deprived of an effective remedy, where a will maker seeks to avoid their legal and moral testamentary obligations. And recall that we link that to the legislature and the Supreme Court of Canada in Tatra, in circumstances that shock the conscience of the court, estate practitioners may be able to rely upon a good conscience, constructive trust to recapture transferred assets driven by the well-established maxim that where injustice arises without a legal remedy, equity must intervene. Back to you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I think that is an exciting concept that you grounded for us in the context of wills variation as we see it here in British Columbia. But I think that concept, as you said, can be expanded and used in other uh, circumstances. And it is exciting because I do think you know, especially as I said at the beginning with the courts being more open to equitable remedies, I do think that we are poised now to, to perhaps see that uh, being put into effect here or perhaps elsewhere in, in Canada more frequently than we've seen in the past. So I'm glad you spent a lot of time to really bring us through that and show how it could be done. Um, that test that you formulated and proposed, I think takes into account the balance that the court is going to need to see as well. So. Um, that's that topic. We have one more topic, uh, which I just want to go through at a high level. It's really about passing accounts and executor remuneration. And we see executor remuneration seems to be a sore point uh, oftentimes in, um, in, the, in the files that we see. Uh, you know, the, and, and it arises, I think, in, uh, in some way because there isn't full transparency and there has been some sort of um, underlying conflict that leads to a, a sort of a contested passing of accounts. Now we know that at common law, the executors are entitled to be compensated for their administration of the estate. That only makes sense. How else are we going to entice people to carry out this very important function? Um, but it's also been put into the provincial legislation. Here in BC, it's called the Trustee Act. And um, while we have it in the Trustee Act, um, actually what we see is that we refer very frequently to this decision, which is still a leading decision. It's from 1905 out of Ontario called the Toronto General Trust Corporation. And this case actually has been referred to in all the provinces except um, Quebec and Newfoundland, I think. So this is something that we see. It lists out these five factors and keeping in mind um, that really these five factors can overlap and um, work that it falls into one category can fall into another. Really, I just wanted to highlight these to help you think when you were putting together your case to help your client get remuneration or push back on somebody who wants remuneration, um, how these facts might be um, relevant and what evidence you should be thinking about gathering. And so when they're talking about how much uh, remuneration there should be, the court is looking at, first of all, the magnitude of the trust. So they're going to look at what is the value of the assets, but also how are the assets held? Are these just a bunch of GICs that have very passive work required by the, um, by the executor? Or is there something that's more complicated? Is there an ongoing business that has to be managed until it can be put into shape to be sold, right? So that's going to be a very important factor. What is it that they're actually having to do? And in terms of that care and responsibility required, 
a lot of times there's going to be litigation. And we always think of maybe there's a state litigation, maybe there's a proof in solemn form claim. But don't forget, there's other types of litigation that are going to require more care and responsibility and which is going to push up the uh, remuneration a court is prepared to um, give to or grant to that executor. So if a property is under foreclosure or if litigation has to be commenced to collect in the debts of the estate, those are going to tend to increase the, um, the amount. Uh, the time occupied in administration, the point that I think we really need to keep in mind here is the court is not going to condone make work projects. So if the executor wants to record 500 hours for cleaning out the house, it's unlikely that the, you know, unless it's, you know, some kind of mansion with um, all sorts of things in it, it's unlikely the court's going to say 500 hours was reasonably spent. It wasn't proportional to the, the work that you were carrying out. Also, uh, the fourth category is skill and ability displayed. What are the complexities of the issues that have to be addressed? How much delegation happened? Because you are allowed to delegate some work, but if you do that and payments are made, then you're going to have your remuneration reduced accordingly if you are the executor. And finally, success achieved in the final result. And the piece that I wanted to highlight here is you need to remember that it's not just what was the opening balance of the estate and what was the closing balance. What we're looking at is, um, was any increase or decrease in the value of the estate attributable to the actions of the executor or perhaps the inactions of the executor? So those were just some pieces I wanted to bring to our attention to remind us of the types of inquiries that we would be making when we're giving advice to our clients as to the amount of remuneration that might be acceptable. So we've got a little bit of time, Monica, now for questions and further discussions. Yes. Uh, Amy and Mark, can you speak a bit about evidentiary problems arising with fact that testator is deceased? Evidentiary problems relating to the fact that the testator, the key witness, if you will, has died by the time a state litigation comes into play? That, yes. yes. So basically, it's about hearsay, I, I would assume, is the question. And um, Mark, uh, is that right if I, I have? And so with respect to hearsay um, issues, um, I think the first step is to look at the type of claim that you have. In British Columbia, we have some statutory exceptions to hearsay and to the type of evidence that the court will bring in. I'm thinking of in particular, there's a section in our wills variation provisions, I think it's 62, that talks about bringing in the evidence and the wishes of the deceased for consideration when the court's deciding whether or not to vary the will. And so that's going to allow some latitude and some, maybe some broader powers or more relaxed standards, if you will, to get the evidence into the court. Uh, section 59, which is our rectification, uh, section under WESA that talks about the type of evidence that can come in uh, on a rectification application as well. So my advice is look first to the statute if there is one to see if there's any um, guidance from our legislature on the type of evidence that can go in. Um, think as well if it's the type of claim as a proof in solemn form. Think as well of the exception to the wills privilege or sorry the wills exception to solicitor client privilege. When you're challenging the validity of the will, the solicitor's file becomes fair game, it gets disclosed, and the solicitor usually is going to testify as to what the deceased told him or her when they were doing the planning. So that's a way to get in the evidence of the deceased. Um, if you're looking just at hearsay, uh, remember the rules surrounding hearsay. Uh, we need to prove that it's both reliable and necessary. I think we have as the state litigators when we're trying to get in the evidence of the deceased, I think we have a bit of a leg up in terms of necessary because there's no other way to get in those statements. So what you really want to look at is, you know, assuming that it's relevant and you need to put it in, um, how can you prove that it's reliable? How can you satisfy the court that this evidence is good evidence? So for example, if the deceased said something that you want to bring into uh, trial, um, if there was more than one person that heard it, I'd bring both those witnesses if they're still alive so that it's not just one person, especially a party saying this is what I heard. If you've got outsiders that can say I also heard it, I think that would be helpful. Um, 
Mark, is there something else that we should talk about on that front or Monica? Uh, if not, Mark, I can go to the next question. No, I think you handled that, uh, that handled that well. Okay, great. Can a good conscience constructive trust claim undo an inter vivos trust or spousal trust? Uh, Amy, do you want me to just uh, address that briefly? Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to step back. It might be something implied in that question, which suggests that we have been successful in using the good conscience constructive trust in the wills variation claim. We haven't yet. It's, it, it was actually rejected in the, the Meyer decision, uh, but I think it was rejected there because uh, there wasn't a um, full argument and the facts didn't, uh, uh, didn't leap out at the judge as being uh, particularly egregious. Um, so it, it really is a cause of action that is that, that is in flux. The reason that we are of the view that in the wills variation context, it, it's strong is that there is a legislative right given to spouses and children. And that is a right that has been given a moral, a very strong moral underpinning by the Supreme Court of Canada. So we end up with the equitable maxim uh, of where there is a right without a remedy, there is a manifest injustice. We don't want to operate in a legal system where there are theoretical rights, but there is no practical efficacious way of giving a remedy to that right. And that is the huge gap in the legis between the legislation on the one hand and the reality of a state of, of a state planning on the other. Now, when we move to the uh, question about trusts, those aren't specifically referred to in the Wills Variation Act. There is no statutory right that is operating. So I think the argument is is one step removed and perhaps harder. On the other hand, if one goes back to the foundational principle articulated by Lord Denning, that the courts are mandated to act, they can act with the vehicle of the good conscience constructive trust whenever the circumstances require the disgorging of property from one party back to another. So I would say here, it's all about the facts and um, whether they involve a parent to a child, whether the child suffered abuse, whether the child was given, given promises, whether the beneficiaries under the trust were complicit in an attempt to conspire against, let's say, the children in uh, ensuring they, 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 they were deprived of, of any, uh, any largesse from the family wealth. So I think it's an argument that in principle can be used. Uh, I wanna be cautious and conservative though, whether it will ultimately be successful. Again, all will turn on the facts. Okay, great. We have time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. How does someone challenging the testator's capacity obtain medical records regarding the testator's capacity? Amy, do you want to sure. So in British Columbia, we can file a notice of dispute when we think that there is an issue with capacity and we file it with the court registry and that stops probate from being granted, but it also puts the other parties on notice that there's a claim. Uh, oftentimes what will happen is um, you'll talk to the other lawyer and you'll agree that we'll request the, um, the medical records and those will come by agreement. Um, if they don't, you're going to need to start, um, start proceedings, perhaps, and um, bring an application for production of documents. But honestly, for the most part, we get those uh, fairly cooperatively because it is something that is very, very common, at least here in British Columbia, to get those medical records when we are alleging incapacity. Yeah, yeah I, I might add that that's, uh, that is the case. The only challenge we have sometimes is working through the various levels of bureaucracy and that's why we 
we urge everyone to move as quickly as possible in getting those letters and demands out. Okay, great. I just want to recap and just uh, mention that the webinar recording, the presentation, and any unanswered questions will be sent out in a follow-up email after today's session. I would like to thank Amy and Mark for taking the time to speak to us today, as well as everyone who has attended. For anyone interested in purchasing a copy of Amy and Mark's book, British Columbia Estate Litigation, it is available on the LexisNexis eStore at lexisnexis.ca slash store. We will be offering a 20% discount with a special promo code in the thank you email along with the eStore link. Amy and Mark, would you like to say any closing words? Mark? Well, we want to thank uh, all of the contributors, all of the members of our firm who helped uh, write the book and uh, LexisNexis for supporting us in, in the writing of it. And, giving us these continued opportunities to talk about important concepts in state litigation. I agree. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.